Richard Skipper celebrates. Every show is a celebration. Richard Skipper celebrates the best in entertainment. Each show, Richard delivers the artists you love, showcasing what makes them unique, never gossipy. The antidote to a sometimes hectic world. Now, here's your host, Richard Skipper. Happy Monday, everyone. Happy July 5th. Happy whatever you are celebrating today. Welcome to the latest edition of Richard Skipper Celebrates. For those of you who are here for the first time, my show is about celebrating artists and their body of worth. What makes a great artist? How do they get from point A to point B and beyond? And I am so excited because in the house today is the one and only Eileen Kristen. We know her from Broadway. We know her from recordings. We know her from soaps. We know her from being right here with me right now. Uh, Eileen, I want to, before we jump into everything that's coming up, and you've got some exciting things ahead, um, how are you? What are you celebrating today? Well, um, we got through this pandemic and I'm beginning to really feel that um, more and more every day that we will get on the right track again. I was just out with a young friend of mine who's a photographer and his whole business kind of collapsed over the last year. He's quite, you know, young, excellent photographer. He does casting for print things and he was doing so well before the pandemic, and then all of a sudden it just stopped. And it stopped for a lot of us. Well, let me go to what was your schedule like when everything shut down last year? And what was the biggest impact that the past year had on you personally? Well, I couldn't um, take my Bikram classes. You know, I wasn't working and I wasn't uh, doing a soap at the time that the pandemic started. I was traveling a lot. But I'm used to going to that 105 degree room every day and just sweating out everything and anything. And I loved it so much and that just stopped. And also I'm a subway girl, you know, I kind of grew up on the subway. I grew up in Brooklyn and then in Queens and I've lived on the subway and not being able to take the subway was like, Wow. I didn't go out of the house for like two weeks. I just poked my head out. So I live in a brownstone, so I kind of poked my head out. Uh, but fortunately, my boyfriend went and put his hazmat suit on. And <laughs> away. Well, so. where, where were you on the spectrum of uh, dealing with this? Uh, were you that person who was thinking this is going to blow over in a few weeks? Or did you really think that we were all in this for the long haul? I felt we were in it for a haul. We were not being given the truth and knowing who the uh, man in charge was at the time. We weren't getting any of the stories. So I knew that anything he said, just do, you know. Do the opposite. <laughs> absolutely the opposite. And that was most unfortunate. Be and I was prepared. I mean, I, I, I got everything pretty together here. Uh, and it, it wasn't work so much just as the, the health of people that you care about. I have a 92 year old mother Wow. and I'm, I'm here and she's in Florida. And so how does that feel? Mm. That doesn't feel good. That doesn't feel good. And, uh, my sister's in California and, and the numbers were raging out there. That doesn't feel good. So not everybody was here, but um, I, I knew we had to be careful. We had to have, be of sound mind, not do anything foolish. And um, I tried not to complain, but, it, you know, we don't appreciate certain things. That's right. That's I right. Only thought I appreciate a lot of things, but just being able to, as I said, just get on the train and go do what I want. Go, go downtown, go uptown, go see my friends. And well, you know, it's funny that you say that because I've been thinking also about this past year and I think of it as a pause. I think it's a time for us to pause and think about the things that we take for granted. 
We take for granted that we're going to go online and we're going to order two tickets for the show of our choice. Absolutely. And then we're going to show up and that it's all going to unfold as we were used to. I don't yeah. think we can ever take this for granted anymore. I, I doubt it. <laughs> um, my dear friend, Anthony Barilli, who was in uh, Tommy, he would get free tickets for a lot of things. So uh, we would, you know, we would go with my boyfriend and we would go to the theater and then all of a sudden it stopped. And, and that was that was tough because I'm used to going in the theater like three times a week or going to a movie or and uh, that was it was I'm not going to say it wasn't tough. I mean, I Netflix my brains out. I watched every episode of Call My Agent, the French show. <laughs> Two days. I just like devoted my life to call my agent. And, uh, you know, did, I you, did you become a binger over the past year or were you already a binger? I became more of a binger for sure. I really, you know, that Bikram yoga keeps me pretty busy. So, <laughs> uh, you know, I wasn't binging as much, but without Bikram, and I would take the Zoom. Bikram. But when you when you're in a 105 degree room, there's this two hour period after where you're just like basking in this endorphin glow. So sometimes I would walk for like a two miles after the class. It was kind of I'd say it's a little bit nutty. Um, I was I'm not saying I wasn't. A, I'm a television kid. I grew up on I grew up having the television as kind of my babysitter. Mm -hmm. I, was, I love Lucy. I was an I love Lucy and Gail Storm fanatic. Then you know uh, the Dick Van Dyke show. So I just sometimes turn the television on so that my own animal brain doesn't take over. If I have too many thoughts going on in my brain, I just turn the television on, and and it's a, not a good habit. I don't think it's a great thing, but uh, that's what I do. Well, I want to take you back a little bit. I want to go back to that five-year-old girl growing up in Brooklyn, uh, being watching television, uh, possibly dreaming of one day being on television herself. Um, I always like to go back to the five-year-old self because yes. that's the time before peer pressure is added on, before teachers start defining who you should or should not be. Can you take us back? It was Eileen Schatz, am I correct? Yes. Okay. yes. So growing up in Brooklyn, uh, tell us a little bit about what your family life was like. Well, it was a very bohemian family. My father uh, was a hairdresser. Mm -hmm. So uh, and he experimented on my mother and my sister and I, but mostly on me. And uh, um, he, you know, and he was known for like with some of his female clients of uh, they had a long ponytail and he go, oh, we're going to put your hair up in the ponytail. And then he'd go cut. And he did that, I think, with my mom. I didn't let him quite do that. But it was a very artistic household. And I was watching Ginger Rogers and Fred Astaire movies, like even younger than that, probably. Mm -hmm. And I somehow knew I was going into that end of creativity. But it wasn't until I went to the Japanese gardens. And I don't know if it was the Miss Rheingold it was the Miss Rango. Oh, uh, yes. And, and you know, at my corner little deli on the corner, the Miss Rango pictures would always be up. So I'm not sure if it was a Miss Rango, but I remember her looking at me when I was a, I probably about five years old and going, oh, you're going to be an actress. And I don't even know if I knew what actress meant. But then uh, one day uh, we had a little beach house and I remember being in this outdoor shower and a voice very much like Billy Burke from the, you know, the good With witch. The I yes. remember hearing this voice going, yes, you're going to be an actress. <laughs> and, uh, and, and I was like, oh, I'm going to be an actress. So I really felt like I got that message from on high. Now, mm -hmm. can I fast forward just a little bit? Absolutely. Like eight years old, because that was uh, actually nine years old. But we used to say that I was eight years old. Don't ask me why they took a year off my age. I started dancing with Latin bands, uh, Tito Rodriguez. Um, oh, wow. I used to listen to Tito Puente. That's what played in my house. And nobody in my family is Spanish, but mm -hmm. that's what we listened to. 
and um, so and uh, Johnny Pacheco and my first job and I don't actually think I got paid for it but I danced in a Latin dance team with two 30 year old Cubans <laughs> how many people can have that on their resume nobody no, I don't know no. that many especially being well, a little I mean, you, you, your, your father was artistic. Uh, yeah. Tell us a little bit. My parents were great dancers. They were great, like, you know, ballroom dancers. Without being really formal about it, they, they really could hit the dance floor and look great. I started taking dance classes probably at five years old. Now, when you started taking the dance classes and you started dancing professionally, did you feel at that point that you were on your path of where you were headed or was this a hobby for you at the time? No, not a hobby, not a hobby at all. Um, I felt like it, it was in, it was definitely going to be my path, but I also instinctively knew that I didn't want to do it too early and not have a childhood. Mm -hmm. I, I kind of knew that I had a certain wisdom that uh, my parents took me to a modeling agency around the time of seven years old. And I stood in line with these other kids and these stage parents. And it, it made me ill. It, it didn't feel good. And I, I kind of knew that I wanted to wait to go into it professionally. I was lucky that I had uh, a most wonderful mentor who at 14 years old gave me my first job, which was mathematics. Wow. Okay. Yes. Okay. There's nobody, there was nobody finer and he treated me, I was a student of his, he gave me a scholarship, I didn't really need a scholarship, but he wanted to encourage me and he gave me my first job on the Bell Telephone Hour. Wow, wow. And, uh, yes, and uh, uh, it, it was monumental because I didn't have to audition for it. It kind of spoiled me, I have to say, it kind of spoiled me. Uh, but he gave me this first job and uh, I talk about it in the show that I'm going to do with Carol Demas about that. I had to do a cartwheel on that show and this was live television, the bell telephone hour. I'd never done a cartwheel before. And actually I've never done one since. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's funny. I was reading on uh, Wednesday. I'm doing a show about Alice Pierce and mm -hmm. she auditioned for a sitcom, which she got. Uh, and she told them she could drive a bus and that's how she got the job. And when she got on the bus and she's got all these kids and Debbie Reynolds on the bus and they realized that she didn't know how to drive. She had never driven before in her life. Oh my God. But are you this believer? I mean, we're told in this business, say yes, and then figure out how you're going to do it. Well, yes, I do know. I, well, yes, except that at a certain point, I knew that I wasn't going to be a good enough dancer to get past 18 years old. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's an interesting story with that where Michael Bennett, I was working with Michael Bennett, and um, I was doing the Milliken show. And I was in high school, and I was dancing with Byark Lee, one wow. of the best. Yes. And uh, Joyce James, who was uh, did Ermagard in uh, Hello, Dolly. We had done Henry Sweet Henry together. Mm -hmm. And I had done a lot of work with Michael after that. He wanted us to do uh, Foyte turns. And also my friend, Gina Page. And all these girls, I knew they were better ballet dancers than I was, particularly Bayark. And he wanted us to do Foyte turns in back of... Joyce Kuoko, who was uh, like a Gelsey Kirkland. Um, she was like a phenom and she could do like a hundred Foyte turns. And this was at the end of rehearsal. And um, I, I, I think I went completely white and knew that to, the next day was going to be like the most embarrassing day of my life. <laughs> well, I prayed, I prayed that somehow this did not, this was not going to go down. I didn't go to sleep. I, cause I had been doing really well with Michael. I kind of proved myself to Michael, but this was gonna destroy everything. So the next day I got up, went to rehearsal and Michael's there with a cigarette and I'm going, oh no, what, you know, those Forte turns are coming. He goes, you know, you can't do those Forte turns because you're gonna be wearing snow suits. And I was like, oh. but I had made a promise. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I had made a promise to the great unknown that I would stop really calling myself a dancer and I would start studying acting. And that's exactly what I did. 
And well, I, I also read in my research that you saw Sandra Lee and Peter Pan, and that had a major impact on you. you. Major, um, major. And, um, you know, I, I would watch her in that and I'd go, I'm going to do that. See, I knew I was going to mm -hmm. do something. I mean, y y when, and she was definitely uh, a men, um, uh, she didn't know she was a mentor, but I met her at, um, well, this is a weird story. I was at a clean, a cleaners opened up on Amsterdam Avenue in, in 77th Street. And I'm standing behind this woman. I don't see her face at all. And she's very tiny, like up to here. Yes. I thought it was a child. Um, and I said, it's either a child or it's Sandra Lee. And I, I heard this voice in my ear go, it's Sandra Lee. Really Talk to Sandra Lee, talk to her. And I'm going like, you're really, whoever you are, you're really crazy. So she kind of turned to the side and I went, I think that's Sandra Lee. So I went, excuse me, are you Sandra Lee? And she goes, indeed I am. And I went, you know, you're one of the reasons why I'm in this business. And she went, well, let's meet Critique. And I haven't seen her since the pandemic. I have to call her. And I've worked with her. She's directed Let's me. Put together because she's a very dear friend of mine. Well, she, her, she's, she's really, she is a force of nature. Mm -hmm. And talk about someone who just keeps going and keeps going and finds things to do. I, I used to substitute her acting classes for her, but I used to watch her acting classes. I used to just sit and observe her, her acting classes. And then when she would go away, um, which I think she had a Moroccan trip and uh, I subbed for her and I was really honored to do that, you know. That's wonderful. Now I wanna go into the mindset instead of the child. Uh, when you saw Sandra Lee on stage, was it the actress that you wanted to become or was it Tiger Lily who you wanted to become? Or was it a combination of both? Or a combination of both. I, I, I was wise enough to know that there was an actress mm -hmm. uh, there was an actress there playing the role. Uh, but um, I thought she defied nature because there's one thing when they go to the side, when they lean to the side, mm -hmm. I don't know if that was an effect, but I went, I want to create magic like that. You know, performers are magical. That's at right. Our best, at our best, we create magic and we also heal people. And that was the biggest thing is that I felt I, I, I was pretty wise as a child and I felt I had that healing gift. I don't know why I knew that. And that's the way I have seen it, which hasn't made me almost as ambitious as I could be because it's never been about the money mm -hmm. ever, ever. It's been about um, making people feel something or feel better about themselves or feel better about their day. And uh, when I got One Life to Live, it was the day before 9-11. And uh, then 9-11 happened and I, and I knew I was facing this big job. And I thought, what does acting really mean? What, what is that going to mean in this world? Mm -hmm. What is it really going to mean? And um, I had two weeks until I started. First of all, they wanted to negotiate with me that day, but it was like, <laughs> did you just see two buildings just fell down? You know, I'll go to work for free because that's the way I feel about it. Mm -hmm. And um, and they had told me the character's name was Roxanne, and I immediately went Roxy. Mm -hmm. And I and and in two weeks' time, I said I am going to entertain the troops. So I I think that's something that I've always mm -hmm. known for even from the time I was little. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But I also knew that I didn't want to spoil it at a certain at a very young age and not enjoy that riding my bicycle or playing punch ball out on the street or just being a regular kid. I somehow knew that I needed to be a regular kid at least for a little while. Well, I, that, you, were also, you were also very fortunate that you had parents that were very supportive of you. A lot of kids don't have that when they make that decision to go. Was there a particular moment where out loud, you said, Mom, Dad, this is what I want to do with my life. Oh, well, as soon as Matt Maddox, you know, gave me that job, we, I joined I joined AFTRA. Then I joined, uh, without even a job, they let me join SAG and Equity. 
So, oh yeah, no, I was off and running. I got a manager, uh, J the actor, John Spencer, his mother was Millie Spencer and she, she came out of nowhere. I don't know. She just kind of called our house. And the uh, next thing I knew I had a manager and I had commercial agents and, oh no, I was at 14 years old, I was off and running. And the, the weird thing is, is when I finally, uh, and there's going to be a tape of this bell telephone hour uh, on the show that I'm doing with Carol, I was suited up and this was my first job ever. And I, I was, I was good to go. I was good to go. I, I thought I'd be more, First of all, I was really nervous watching this little tape, but but then I looked at it and I went, you go, girl. You know, you were just, you know, you did the job. You were I, ready when that what? door opened. What? You were ready when that door opened. Yes, I was. And then it was, it was a no-brainer after that. It never, um, you know, then I got um, Henry Sweet Henry uh, with Michael Bennett. And which was a very scary experience. I was 15 going on 16 and um, you had to pick up combinations really fast. And that was, I, I was not expert at that either. And it was a rough go for the first month. I kind of felt like I was a little bit of a scapegoat because I just wasn't that quick, mm -hmm. but I proved myself to Michael. That's why I, I was so upset with the Foyte thing that I was so scared that he, Michael was going to go, yeah, I knew all along she couldn't dance. But, but I worked for him. I did Henry Sweet Henry. I did a television show that he choreographed with Robert Mo Morse called Let Us Entertain You. I did two Millican shows. I did, um, I did the, the uh, Peter Noon played Pinocchio and I was a puppet that, <laughs> Tommy Toon kind of choreographed the thing, but you know, my mother's favorite words were Bob Avian called. Uh, and I, I got to tell that to Bob before he passed away. Wow. Um, a great man. He was great man. And, but I would come home from school and my mother would go, Bob Avian called. <laughs> And I told that to Bob. I said it was like my mother's, my mother's favorite words. Bob Avian called, you know. So it was um, it the biggest decision was the dance thing, because I could fake it, and it was my first love. Um, you know that whole time I was studying with a jazz vocal uh, teacher, and mm -hmm. I knew words to like so many songs. I I loved uh, Kay Thompson. She was another. Wow. Well, never knew she was my mentor, but you know, um, when she did, you know, clap your hands, give, you know, give me some heat, boy, heat, boy, heat, boy, give me that, give me that, you know, and it was like, I'm gonna do that. Were you able to do that type of a show? Have you ever done no, that? that? No, I've never done that because I've I've kind of written my own stuff, and um, and when I've done a show, it's been more um rock, but I always wanted, I, I had this dream to do with Leah Delaria to do the song, um, how to be lovely. You gotta be happy. You know, I thought that would be a hoot and a half, you know, if anyone's watching, it could happen. Well, you never know. You never, you never know. know. You I'm going to go back to Henry, sweet Henry, your first Broadway show you're in the show. Um, I want to know the impact uh, you talk about the dance and, you know, getting through that, but the big impact that it made on you in terms of discipline, uh, which is, of course, very important on Broadway, getting into that uh, mindset of eight shows a week, going through that. It was no problem. And I was in high school. Don't, I'm not even sure how I got my homework done. I know I did. And we lived in Queens at the time. So it was, you know, that was a little bit difficult, but I was so disciplined. I get to... I get to half hour, half hour before half hour, which I sometimes I when I was doing Greece, I would get there an hour before half hour. And when I would, did mayor because it was downtown, I'd get to the Greenwich Village like an hour and a half before because I was scared that I might get stuck on the train. So I've always had that discipline that that discipline comes with the job. And if someone doesn't understand that as a performer, mm -hmm. they are missing. Um, because, you know, you can be brilliant at what you do, but if you're not reliable 
And if you're late and you walk in, like being two minutes late doesn't matter, it does. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I really saw that with some of the young performers on, um, on One Life to Live, um, they would not be on time for that rehearsal, that initial rehearsal in the morning. That throws everything off. And I actually went in and lectured um, one of the young men who's no longer alive. I, I adored him, but he showed up with an, a, a, you know, a bull excuse. And I came into his room and I said, you know, you just threw everybody off. Well, I don't know. It was like I, I fell asleep in the cab. I said, mm -mm. don't ever try that one again. So um, I think the discipline part of it is, is part of our job. Um, and I, maybe I'm a little uh, neurotic about that, um, that uh, I also, when I was doing General Hospital, I found that some of the actors really didn't care about running lines. Uh, I mean, Maura West did, who played my daughter in it. She's extremely disciplined, but it was hard finding some of the other people. I'd be like, doesn't anybody want to run any lines? I once hit the floor at General Hospital. First of all, they keep it like, you know, 50 degrees. So you're nervous. And, and it's like, and there was one time where I basically went on set without running the lines with anybody because I couldn't find anybody. And that made me upset. That. Did you find there was a different mindset uh, between the way that the West Coast actors uh, approached their work and the New York actors? I'm, I'm assuming that a lot of the New York actors have a theatrical background, more so than on the West Coast. So what are some of the differences between the two? It's that running lines thing. <laughs> you know, lines can be up in your head, but if they don't soak through your body, you're too cerebral about it. It's And that was the wonderful thing about Ryan's Hope. Th these were all stage actors. Helen Gallagher, Kate yeah. Russell. These were all stage actors. Uh, and we rehearsed. Uh, Ron Hale, we rehearsed. Uh, we had run through, we had a dress rehearsal. We had a run through, a dress rehearsal, and then we go to tape. I couldn't run lines enough. And I still can't if I'm doing a play. Mm -hmm. I get in early and I ask the person that I'm working with to get in early. You know, once when I was doing Grease, I went out on stage. Something distracted me and I got out on stage and I said, hi, kids. Well, don't say hello. My first line is Patty Simcox. And I don't remember any other. I, I was blank for that whole scene. I think I said I was running for secretary of the United States of the Treasury. I don't know what I said. <laughs> And nor did anybody else, and nor did anybody else know what line to throw me. And I never went out on stage again without looking at my lines beforehand. Uh, I so read, say what I've done. I read somewhere, you know, Carol Channing, she used to do or, or read the script backwards before going on and would go out to make her entrance uh, when it was when she'd gotten through the entire script. She timed herself in terms of going backwards, yeah. in terms of the way that she looked at everything. You've also been very fortunate to do long runs, both on Broadway and in the soaps. Mm -hmm. um, do you find that for you, uh, that it's like a, a nice warm blanket around you to be in a long run of a show? Well, it is, it's a privilege. Uh, you know, Henry Sweet Henry didn't make it, it, it ran for two months and it should have been a hit. Yes. And that was a crime. Uh, Greece, I, I stayed with the show for two and a half years. And, um, and I was really honored to do that. Uh, I knew that if I, I, I knew that I was not one of these people that was going to necessarily get a job from doing that character. Cause it's, it's a, it was an interesting character to me, but it wasn't the, they looked at more of the greasers. And I said, unless I leave this, I'm not going to get another job. And I left. And then about six months later, I got Ryan's Hope. And I know that nature loves a void for me. And I can't, I can't speak for anybody else. Uh, you know, Adrienne Barbeau, it was so wonderful. She was doing the show and they saw her. Uh, they immediately had her test for Maud, for the show Maud. But I somehow knew that wasn't going to happen for me. And it was kind of sad, not like knowing that, 
but I love doing Greece because I love the camaraderie of the people. You well, know. you have a very interesting point. I, there comes a point in an actor or actress's uh, career, if they're fortunate enough to be in a hit such as Greece, where you make the decision that it is time to move on. What are the deciding factors for you in terms of moving on beyond a character that is still running? Well, with Greece, it was that I knew that um, I, I didn't want to really play the goody two shoes anymore. In fact, a couple of years later, they asked me to go back to the show and I said, I'll come back, but I have to come back as Marty. And they, you know, I could tell on this phone conversation that it was like, <laughs> he just hang up the phone on her. Um, Cause I felt like after playing Delia, I felt the spectrum of what I really could do. I couldn't go backwards. I had to go forward. Mm -hmm. And um, I left Ryan's Hope the first time after two and a half years, no, excuse me, three, three and a half years. Um, I felt it was time to move on. I'm not so sure that was the right decision mm -hmm. because I was, this was such a wonderful part. And also I was doing so much off Broadway and I was directing things and I had had my own film theater showing avant-garde film. I, I was doing a lot of stuff and also- You had a movie theater. <laughs> we had a movie theater called the Jean Renoir Cinema. Yes. And- um, How did that happen for you? Well, it happened because of the genius kid that I grew up with, Ray Blanco, who's no longer alive. Uh, Ray was this child prodigy and he used to review films when he was like 16 years old and he wanted to meet Vim Vendors and he didn't have the money. So I was doing Greece. I gave him the money to go to Germany to meet Vim Vendors. And then there was a German film. He started distributing films and he was distributing a film called Kings of the Road. Really wonderful German film that Vim Vendors had done. And, um, uh, it, he booked it into a theater on 72nd Street uh, and uh, Broadway, and there was uh, an uprising because there were so many Holocaust survivors in my neighborhood, and by then I mm -hmm. lived in this neighborhood, that they felt that any German film was not a, a good film to have. And he wasn't in control of the publicity. So I think I said to Ray, and I was like all of 25 or something, and I think I said to him, well, you know, if you had your own film theater, you could control this. And the next thing I knew, we found a space and um, and I found my checkbook. And and uh, it was a lot of trials and tribulations with doing that. Not an easy thing to do. And you're dealing with uh, bad landlords and you're dealing with some very shady characters who want protection money. Like, what do I know about protection money for my kids? <laughs> Well, I want to ask you, Eileen, with everything that's happened in your life, I mean, there are some actors or actresses that come along and they map out a career and it unfolds as they imagined it or it unfolds as they had not imagined it. Um, the talent obviously is there. Uh, you also have been very, very fortunate with the people that you've known, the connections you've made over the years, the relationships that you've built. Um, how would you say the trajectory of your career has gone as far as ambition is concerned? And then the other end of the spectrum, being at the right place at the right time and being ready when opportunity came knocking at the door. Well, I was always ready. You know, I always try to keep myself in good shape. It's like when One Life to Live came up, I was so ready. I, you know, it was like, I was ready. I was in fighting shape and I was ready. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's really odd from doing the soap. Um, I knew that I could get another soap job without having to audition pretty much. Mm -hmm. But everything else, I've every play I've had to audition. Well, that's not exactly true. Once I worked for a director, but it's funny because a lot of the people that I worked for ended up dying. So, you know, I had this connection with this uh, wonderful director and he would always say to me, I'm not going to make you audition because sometimes, you know, Eileen, your auditions are not, I know what, because auditions make me nervous. They really make me nervous. Some people see them as opportunities. I see them, uh, I, I wish if I could invite people to my house or even do an audition like this uh, in my domain somehow, I'm a Leo and, and I, I, you know, every audition I've ever done in my house, people have come to my house 
and they've auditioned me and I know before they're out the door, I've got the job. Mm -hmm. I know that because somehow I, I, you know, it's really hard walking into a cold space. I know it's, it's incredibly hard. It's very hard. And then at a certain point, I also realized that I was more of a jazz rock singer, that Broadway. I really didn't have a legit voice. I kind of found my lane musically. And then I, I discovered that I had a really good writing ability. And uh, so I kind of created my own pathway with that. When I got mayor, I came in late after the show had been cast. Now that's Charlie Strauss. Mm. And I... I love Charlie Strauss, but I knew that I'd have to do something so different. Now, um, um, Warren Light, who wrote the book, he had mm -hmm. seen me in a comedy review. So he knew that I could do like 10 different characters. He had seen me in a comedy review that I did at um, Ensemble Studio Theater uh, called uh, Strange Behavior. But I, I would have to prove something to Char Charles, Mr. Strauss. So I came in and I did the song... Um, Danny's All-Star Joint, which had so many lyrics. Downstairs at Danny's All-Star Joint, they got a jukebox and it goes on and on and it's tongue twisty and it's, and he sat there like very entertained. I went, I'm gonna get this role. But I've had to do things, if I can go in and I can find my lane and do it as best as I can do it, um, then and you know, with everything, have a lot of opportunities come your way uh, because of your uh, body of worth, as I like to refer to it as, um, or have you actively pursued certain roles? That's a really good question, and it's I. Well, I I tried to actively pursue uh, the role um, in. Um, Raging Bull, that, um, her name is escaping me right now. Uh, it's, um, uh, it's there, I know exactly who you're talking about. a friend of mine, but anyway, I, 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 I did pictures of my hair in a pompadour. I did, you know, I knew De Niro. I knew the casting person. I sent in a whole, and they just never called me. They wanted a complete unknown. And the fact that I had, you know, the fact that I had done a soap opera worked against me for a lot of stuff. And all and also because I consider myself a comedi comedian, uh, if someone hadn't seen me on the soap and they go, well, she's done all these soaps, it did not work in my favor. Mm -hmm. If they saw some of the scenes that I had done in the soap and they saw what I did without a laugh track, I think they would open their heart to me. But it doesn't always, the things that make you really great or or give you power in the business don't always lead to the next thing. Now, I want to talk about your musicality, which is going to take us uh, to Friday night. Um, I, I spent this afternoon listening to you uh, and really listening. And there, you've got this very smoky quality uh, to your voice. And it's almost as if uh, a pop rock, uh, jazz, uh, blues, uh, um, alchemy is happening when I hear you. Um, and how did you discover this with your voice? Because it's almost as if you're walking down three different paths. <laughs> well, you know, I listened to a lot of Peggy Lee as okay. a kid. I listened to a lot of Joe Williams and I saw that, oh, Joe has a deep voice and I could have a deep voice too someday. Mm -hmm. And, um, and Kay Thompson, mm -hmm. um, and, um, but even listening to Audrey Hepburn when she did, when she did, um, how long has this been going on? Uh, it, it spoke to me. She certainly wasn't the greatest singers. And some of the people that I really like are not people with, uh, you know, um, huge amount of octaves. Um, but, um, they just affect me. I listened to Edie Gourmet. I liked Edie Gourmet and Steve Lawrence a lot. My mother went to school, I think, with Steve Lawrence. Wow, wow. But we uh, kind of knew them. Um, and I studied with this vocal teacher who, he never made me do scales a lot, which the, my discipline is not great. But but I did, um, I, I would do songs like it 
12 years old, the gypsy in my soul. And I would do give me the simple life. And, 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 you know, we would do them in a jazz vein. And um, I kind of knew early on that I wouldn't be a typical singer, uh, but as I wasn't a typical dancer. You know, I think my my greatest gift that I have is my acting ability. I think I can go all over the map with that. But but as far as uh, the singing thing, I, I found Elaine and, you know. And well, when did you discover that you had the gift of writing? And when was the first time that you actually performed one of your original songs in front of an audience? Well, I knew that I had a gift. I used to write poetry, uh, but also my... Um, first real boyfriend was a jingle singer and um, we just started writing together. And the first song that I wrote, I think was called leave me something behind. And um, it was about if you leave the relationship, I'm sorry for the phone ringing. I took this, I unplugged. That's Carol Dimas calling us, isn't it? <laughs> is that my phone or your phone? It's yours. Mine is well. But this is so strange because I purposely unplugged it's, this. It's okay. Thank Sorry. You. Um, you know, when I heard the score for the Fantastics, I'm going to talk when I talk to Carol about this. Fantastics blew me away. I learned all the lyrics within two days of getting that album. And the first time that you saw it, was it with Carol in it? Rita Gardner. Oh, Rita Gardner. That's the first week that it opened. Uh, wow, wow. So sweet. Well, I want to ask you, I mean, a lot of people know, of course, uh, your history with Greece and everything. What is it about that cast that you all have remained uh, over the years so friendly? Uh, anyone knows in this business, you do a show sometimes and everybody disperses. But this cast has such a bond with each other. What do you think that was all about? Everything. Because first of all, it was a hit. Mm -hmm. And hits have a tendency, I think, from the other people that I know that were in hit shows. They have a long history. So the excitement, and then if they revive it, the excitement comes back again. Then if they revive it again, and... Um, but because we, we played high school students in it, we kind of fell into these roles of like alumni, you know, that we were alumni. And um, there was a real affection for each other and a sense of, it, and because it was a true ensemble. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That also, I think, um, I mean- I shared a dressing room with someone I think that, uh you know, a lot of our friends know. And there's a line from Gypsy, uh, sharing a dressing room is a lot like sleeping together. You, <laughs> share, you share your secret. Dirty laundry. You know, uh, I'll tell you very quickly, there's a very funny story, Sandra Lee, and this is in her book. Her and Eileen Brennan shared a dressing room in Hello, Dolly. And they had a huge feud. And they built a wall between the two of them. So one of them got the radiator and the other one got the air conditioner. So one suffered half of the year and the other suffered the other half of the year. That is you know something, somebody should write a play like about that. I guess I could play Sandra. <laughs> wow. So, so what was it like sharing a dressing room with Carol Demas? And I mean, you, I mean, she, I, she's one of my favorite people on the planet. She's one of the most beautiful human beings. I, she's more like family to me. She is family. We grew up in the same area of Brooklyn. We grew up a block away from each other, basically. Of course, we didn't know each other then, but we're from the same uh, the same place. And um, we're real Brooklyn girls. And uh, But she's such a sensitive person and so talented. First of all, she what she did with Sandy, I'm not so sure anybody could understand as much as her. She really understood every inch and every cell of that of that mm -hmm. of that woman, of that young girl, Sandy. She knew it. Um, we immediately hit it off. Uh, there were some interesting things which I won't go into. They were slightly gossipy. Uh, we sh we shared some 
weird uh, history. Um, and um, she was very sensitive to that and uh, very understanding of a situation. And um, also when my song was cut from Greece, she was the only person, and this is before we really had this dressing room in existence. She was really the only person who um, came over to me and went, I feel your pain. And because sometimes people feel that that's catching, mm -hmm. you know, like, oh, she got her song cut. I'm going to get my song cut if I, no, I know. You know, examine it too. And um, quite honestly, the song was not good. But still, you know, um, she was so sensitive to that as she's been sensitive to everything and everybody. And, um, you know, and uh, I apologized to her just recently for being a slob. I'm not a slob any longer, but, you know, I think um, I was not as neat. Did you, say that, you mean personally or in your professional career? Because oh, you're no, definitely not a slob. No, no, no. Just in dressing room habits. You know, I mean, just the things I've been. I'd leave, you know, I'd come in early. That's why I would come in like an hour early to like go, what damage did I do? Because, you know, um, after the show was over, I didn't want to like put everything back normally. Uh, I wanted to go out and go to Charlie's and go to Joe Allen's and, you know, and see the people that were waiting at the stage door and say hello. And so, you know, I'd leave the room a little bit of a mess. Um, but um, we loved each other, you know, we, we loved each other. We shared a lot of our everything together. And, um, and also uh, Joy Rinaldi, who was both of our understudies, um, you know, Joy spent a lot of time in our little room also. So the three of us really bonded. And it's funny because I wasn't as close with the pink ladies and that's kind of unfortunate in a way but um, I am now, I'm, I feel like I'm close with them, but you know, you're close with the, that person that you share a dressing room with. You really become, you really bond with that person. And, um, and I trust Carol and uh, I love her dearly. I really, she's got the biggest heart in the world. You know? Now let's go to where we are right now. Uh, you have, uh, th again, this amazing body of worth behind you, but you also have done very well in the world of cabaret. Do you prefer the intimacy of performing under smaller venues? Uh, you do. I like it. I like it. I, I mean, there are certain rooms that I probably could have played where I went, I don't want to play that room because it feels too big or doesn't, mm -hmm. I don't know. I like the intimacy of it. Uh, I like a live audience. Um, when I, I used to be with a Brazilian band and uh, one of the most famous Brazilian bands that were here, uh, a band called Pe uh, Pegi Boy. Many people pronounce it Pe de Bois, but it's Pegi Boy. And um, we played at the old SOBs, which was tiny. Mm -hmm. We had two dancing girls from Brazil and I wrote some music for them and and people were on top of each other and it was great it was really uh, a big band i didn't get to sing all that much but the closeness of that and the sweat and the dancing and the thing that was like i'll never forget the first time i performed with them i went i'm in heaven i'm in heaven i have a shaker in my hand and i'm wearing next to nothing and uh, i think i was wearing a buckskin short <laughs> Sheena of the Jungle outfit. And I remember I had invited uh, the actor Will Patton, who I was doing, um, he played my love interest on on my second go round at uh, Ryan's Hope. And I invited him and I thought, how great. Like, I got this great guy who's watching me here. And I'm like, there were all these Brazilians. It was just incredible. So, yeah, and, that, uh, and then I played the Lone Star which was a tiny little joint also. And the people were like up in your face and up on this balcony and like hanging over this balcony. So, you know, uh, the, the more dive a place, the better. I like it. I, I play at the triad, which is not a dive. Um, and that was a really good room for me. I played a Pangea, which is a really small room. You know, you need birth control in there. You know, it's that's so true. That's true. Now, on Friday night, you are going to be appearing with Carol Demas. Uh -huh. uh, they are coming live 
Uh, and all the details are going to be in the body of the information on YouTube. Mm -hmm. So anyone watching will be able to get all that information on how to get tickets and everything. I've also created an events page for everyone. You can go there and order tickets right there. Um, but you've performed in Carol's home. Uh, this, this, is the first. this is the first? Oh, yes. I mean, I thought maybe you had done some of their house concerts. No. No? This no. The, no. No. The first. So I'm nervous. And I'm not going to lie. I am nervous. Uh, I, not that I haven't done live TV before, but this has certain parameters. You know, how you get on there, what mic. You, uh, you know, there are things. I'm going up there on Wednesday to just rehearse the logistics. We're going to put an order together. Um I, um, for the last year during COVID, I had acid reflux uh, or a situation akin to that. I, they diagnosed it as that. Mm -hmm. And for a year, I had a cough. Me too. Me Crazy, too. right? Yes. And I'm finally, I'm over the hump. But that was scary because I was coughing for literally a year from Father's Day of last year to Father's Day of this year. I remember... I remember that. And it's like, it was like a year, a complete year. And that was really scary. So this is the first singing I've done with that kind of, not COVID, but reflux situation. So I hope I'm okay. You'll I be okay. And I'm going to say, I mean, th what, uh, what she and Stuart have created, first of all, uh, every studio in New York city could take a lesson from these two, especially Stuart. Uh, oh. Sounds amazing. The sound is incredible. The um, I can't wait till Friday night. I'm definitely going to be watching, and I'm giving away a ticket at the end of the show, which I will announce. Um, I've been uh, keeping tabs here, and I've got a a little uh, ticket that I'm giving away as my gift. So um, what can audiences expect uh, from you and Carol on Friday night? Well, it's going to be a grab bag of stuff. We're gonna do a couple songs together. We're gonna to reminisce, of course. Uh, we're Carol and I'm not gonna uh, give away the song, but there was a song that when I was growing up and Carol was growing up and um, that we loved as she was a teenager, I was somewhat younger, but that we loved. And uh, we're gonna do that. That might be our first song. I'm a little scared because I've never really done it before, but it's so ingrained in in my kind of in my psyche. And then uh, we're going to do a, a, another a duet from a Broadway show, and um, and then she's going to sing back up on several of my two of my originals. She's going to sing back up on, and I'm really excited about that. Well, I'm going to be watching, and as I said. All the information will be here, so you'll all be able to get this. We're going to play a little game right now. Okay. Uh, I have questions that are generic questions that are sent to me uh, that I'm going to ask specifically of you. Okay. Uh, and the first question is, what have you lost that you would most like to retrieve? Uh, my uh, youth. <laughs> <laughs> Same here. Uh, what is the best ritual of your daily life? I believe yoga in the morning and sometimes a Pilates class in the afternoon uh, on different days, but that is a ritual. I have to exercise. Okay. A month. Uh, what is the most important action that you've ever taken? Buying two ring lights. <laughs> Good. Um, I might get a third one. Uh, who is the person that you would most like to help in this world? if the opportunity presented itself? Uh, kids that don't know where they're kind of going in life and to find their interests and to talk to them about that and point them in the right direction, which is what I did when I ran an arts program at the Prince George, which is a shelter in the late eighties. Um, I took kids to shows and would talk to them about their interests. And particularly, you know, if I asked one of these kids what happened today? And they go, uh, how you doing? Uh, and they give me like no answer. I go, there's always something that happened. And I go, so what's new? Nothing. And I go, that's not the answer. No, that's not the answer in life. You can't say nothing, nothing, nothing. 
Because mm -hmm. if you say nothing, you have nothing. And what do you want? You know, I wasn't always successful at it. Um, some of my kids, I know they had big dreams and were not able to live them out because of uh, growing up in very poor families. Um, you know, I really felt like I never really wanted kids of my own. It was really funny. I just never had that kind of need. But I, for about four years, I had kids sleeping all over my living room and uh, taking them to the theater. But I, you know, I want to even like I was with a young man today who's a photographer and he's so talented. And um, I just, it's like, I'm there to support you. Uh, sometimes we just need someone to support us. Wow, absolutely. Um, what is the worst thing that you ever said to your mother? Uh, I said, F you. <laughs> and I, I, because she, she came out, she came to visit me. I never said it again, but she came out to, to California and I was really on a thing of buying all these antique, I had dresses from the thirties, but they also had holes from moth eaten things. And she said, how can you walk around like this? And it was the disgust. And, and I felt like she wasn't giving me credit for being creative. And I think I said, F you. Mm -hmm. And um, I never, and that I've never said anything else that. Mm -hmm. Wow. Wow. Um, I shouldn't have said that, but I, I couldn't help myself. <laughs> well, you may have just answered my next question. What is the most rebellious thing that you've ever done? Oh, that's interesting. Um, I, you know, I, I, I quite, uh, as an actor, I'm rebellious. As a human being, I'm not that rebellious. Mm -hmm. You know, I, um, the most dangerous thing I used to do was water ski in a pool um, to I used to water ski in a pool. I was a very good water skier. Mm -hmm. and that was the only sport that I was any good at. So I could, I would do outrageous things if they said, we want to lift you up and we want you to slalom in this <laughs> pool. I would go. Yeah. Because I was not scared of falling in the water. Whereas I couldn't snow ski at all because I was scared of tumbling down a hill in the cold. Mm -hmm. But I'm not a rule breaker as a person. I follow the rules. Okay. Well, then this next question is going to be interesting. But as what, an actor, I don't. What is the most rebellious thing that you've wanted to do? Oh, I've wanted to tell some people off. <laughs> I've wanted to say, you know, you know, you're an idiot. You know, you could you could be a nice person if you. I like nice people. I do too. I do not like when someone is snide or unnecessarily snippy or um, I just don't like it. And I don't think that's the way to get people to do things. You know, I mean, I dealt with Michael Bennett. He could be mm -hmm. snippy and, but he learned from Jerome Robbins. That's right. People learned, you know, and, uh, Ooh, you and know, he was difficult. Oh yeah. And, but do you get better work out of somebody if I've been lucky because I've really worked with great people mm -hmm. who have been pretty nice. And, um, you know, I, but I've often had to say to someone, uh, to a director, if a director comes at me with too many ideas without hearing my own, I will speak up and say, could I try my ideas? And if you think you can add to them, great. Or if you don't like my ideas, that's fine. And I've done, been very successful that way. Um, and I'm, I'm not someone who comes in and goes, Oh, this script is shit. I don't want to do this. I don't, you know, I've been very lucky because especially on the soap, they have let me rewrite. I'm an excellent rewriter. Mm -hmm. wow. I mean, I don't know if I could write the soap from scratch, but boy, could I make it better? I could make it better. So that was very rebellious because I, when I started doing Ryan's Hope, I did these crying scenes, my eye makeup, and they keep on coming over to me and fixing up. I go, no, 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 leave it, leave it. And producers sat me down when I don't know what, uh, you know, this is so outrageous what you're doing. And I said, let the audience judge that. Mm, good for you. 
and the audience was right there. They, they, they were watching a character go through like a revolving door in a hurricane. And um, so I, I stuck to my ground. So as, a, as an actor, I've been fairly rebellious. And my last question to you today, what is the biggest risk that you've ever taken? Oh, that's a really, that's a really good question. Um, I, I, I'm not, as I said, I'm not a risk. To, well, leaving, leaving a job is a, you, a, a big risk. Mm -hmm. It's a big risk. And so sometimes it's good. And I have found that the risks as a human being, um, I, I have an inner logic I'm very logical. I've played characters that, that have no logic whatsoever, but Eileen is very sensible. I used to sit in class with my hands folded. Um, the biggest risk I take is listening to people and shutting up to hear what other people say. And, um, you know, what's hard about the business right now is that you've got to do so much self-promotion that uh, that you've got to say these things about yourself to sell yourself. Whereas in the in the day you, you had a publicist who then could say things about you, or the soap opera magazines could say certain things about you. Mm -hmm. And I don't I don't like going on social media all the time, and 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 I'm not that great at it because um, I feel like I'm a snake oil. I don't think of myself as snake oil, you know, mm -hmm. but. I'm constantly selling this or this or this or this or that, you know, and um, you got to I, I see that if you edit your cover picture, more people are drawn to your uh, your Facebook page. Mm -hmm. I've learned this and it's like, wow, that's a lot of self-promotion. I could do that every day, but it's it's it's, awesome. it's hard. Wow. Really. Well, well, that brings us uh, to my closing remarks. <laughs> Don't go anywhere for a moment. I want to thank everybody for being here today. I know that I can speak for Eileen when I say this. We don't take for granted the fact that you could have been anywhere for the past hour. The fact that you were here with us means the world to me. So oh, well, it means a lot to me. I love doing this, by the way. Well, thank you. Well, I, I am so glad you did this. I'm so glad you said yes to me. Um, I want to thank you all for being here. If you enjoyed today's show, and I hope you did, if it's your first time here, please subscribe to Richard Skipper Celebrates on YouTube. Um, leave a comment. Hit the like button. Share this with your friends um, because that's how we get the word out about what we're doing. And neither Eileen nor I are crazy about doing it, but it's a necessary evil in today's world. Yes, so, it is. You do it really well. Uh, well, thank you. So please do that. I also end every show by telling everyone to go out and do something nice for somebody else without expecting anything in return. Go to your Facebook friends list and the fifth name that pops up, reach out with a phone call, not an email message, not a text message, not a private message, but a phone call to let those people know what they mean in your life. And because today is the fifth, and the fifth comment today was from Tesla Bella, I'm giving her a free seat, front row to Eileen Kristen on uh, Friday night. And I will, sending, I will be sending all the information on how to log in and uh, you know tell your friends about this. Um, I also, you know, we have a dear friend, David Friedman. And he says, we're all in this together, but we're not in the same boat. And you never know what someone else is going through right now. And uh, I always say, if you're going to be out on a boat, make sure that you bring a skipper along. Now, before I go, Eileen, I'm going to leave the screen and I'm going to give you the final word. Anything that you want to say about anything that we talked about today that you want to build upon, anything that we didn't talk about, that you wish we had, or just any message that you want to put out to everyone now. And I want to thank you uh, for the gifts that you've given to the world and that you will continue to give. Uh, your body of worth is always worth celebrating. Thank you for being here today. Thank you so much. Well, that brought tears to my eyes, actually. Um, it, you know, it's been a rough year and, and for some of us rougher than 
you know, than for others. But I, I thank you for any support that you can give me. And if all of you could tune in on Friday, it would mean so much. It really would mean so much to me. And you don't have you don't have to watch it at that seven thirty time. You can buy the ticket, and then you could watch it anytime, anywhere at your discretion. But um, you know, without the audience, you know, <laughs> I love an audience. I'm I'm more interested in the audience sometimes than I am in myself. And I would always say to people in and at my cabaret gig, gigs, leave your leave your phone on. I want to see who's the most popular person in the room. <laughs> so um, I really appreciate and anybody who shows up because I try to show up. I really try to support my friends. I really do. So thank you so much.